Good morning, everyone. Spring has finally arrived. It's amazing. Outside, the sun is shining, the birds are singing, right? <laughs> no, not yet, but we did get a sneak preview last week, and I'm really happy about that. And I love how in our uh, spiritual history and humanity, we have tied the rites of spring, the renewal of that resurrection of the earth and everything coming back to life with our holiest days, with Easter, with Passover. And that all makes sense, how tied we are to the earth, but also to the heavens. And I find that also there's something that's very interesting that's celebrated right at this time of year, every year. And incidentally, it has been celebrated at the same time all the way back in our history, back at least to the times of Christ. And I was so happy I was invited to speak today because today is the day of that special celebration. Does anybody know what that is? April 15th, it's tax day. It's income tax day. We know that. And last year, right at tax time, I had a tremendous spiritual revelation. And today, that's what I want to talk about. I was at home uh, rounding up some more information for the taxes, going over and over things. And for me, um, I'm a business owner, so... I don't have money taken out of paychecks and things. I have to make quarterly deposits. And so throughout the year, I have to estimate and guesstimate how much I think that income's going to be because I must send it into the government because if I don't, they're not very happy about it. So I, I have to work on this all year long, and I have to, to know all these complex tax laws and so on. And I'm thinking to myself last year when all this was going on, because I walked into my office at home, and I passed the entire bookshelves of all my spiritual books and caught them out of the corner of my eye, and I thought, oh, my gosh, this is what they meant. This is what was meant by that passage, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. Because I realize that myself, I have all of this intense effort put into it, as do, do most everyone. And there's a lot of fear around taxes. And, and there are these, um, uh, these in tax enforcers or these enforcing governance we have around the taxes wreak fear amongst people. And I thought of the similarities. And this is where I had my big revelation that I'm going to go through today. Christ had some instructions for us around this matter. During the time of his life, everyone came into the cities for Passover to celebrate, right? And at the time, the Romans had occupied the lands that, where they lived. And so can you imagine foreign troops occupying your city, wreaking, routinely wreaking terroristic acts upon you, forcing you to not only pay taxes to them, but also to obey their laws. In meantime, the rule of that time was through the religious orders, right? It's through, it's through the temple, through the priests, and through the Pharisees, the teachers. And so they were having to keep maintain their power through all of this. So the Pharisees, the, the teachers in the temple, were actually trying to get rid of Christ because he was coming along causing all kinds of trouble, <laughs> messing things up for them. And so they were trying to trap him, and they came to him, and they said, So, if you say that you are the king, then does that mean that we, the, that the Jewish people, don't have to pay their taxes to Rome? And Christ said, Well, my kingdom is not of this world. So they are saying, Did, But does that mean then we don't have to pay our taxes? And he asked them, he said, Show me the kind of coin you would use to pay your taxes. And they produced a coin, and on that coin was a head. And he said, whose head is that? And they said, that is Caesar's head. And we all know Caesar was like the king of, of the whole Roman Empire. That is Caesar. And so he replied to them, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and give unto God what is God's. Okay, I heard this growing up as a child in Catholic church. 
quite often at the church I went to, they said it before they collect the offerings. I'm serious, they did. And, and at least the message I got, and, and I love my Catholic upbringing, so I'm not bemoaning any of it. But the message I got was, well, you pay your taxes to the government, but then you paid your tithes to the church, because that's how it was supposed to be. So a lot of people uh, believed that, that that passage had to do with tithing to the church, just like you would tithe to the government. I mean, the government has a set rate that you have to pay, and some churches ask for a set rate. And, and so that, that was kind of how that was brought about, or, or, or made to come across, or at least that's what I, how I perceived it. But, you know, I have a friend who immigrated here from Germany, and she tells me that if you went to church there, they have church tax, and that they literally take it out of your paycheck. And we'll find in a moment that church tax isn't something that's just so modern. It's been, it's been around for a while. But at any rate, so it's, is it really that give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God? Is it really about tithing? I don't think so. Another area where people think that that passage lends itself to is separation of church and state because we had the Roman armies into the church uh, religious doctrine and, and uh, what authorities of the land so they believe it was separation of church and state and no I don't believe that either but we have to remember again at the time of Christ we had outside forces telling everyone what to do from a foreign land we had religious authorities telling everyone what to do, and then we have a spiritual authority, Christ, coming in and saying, no, we're going to divide everybody up and make everyone you know, pick sides. And so there was a lot of confusion, a lot of fear. People were talking about it. Does it remind you of anything? Does it remind you of anything that's going on today? All right? So what I believe that was meant spiritually by this passage is given to Caesar, meaning Caesar being the world, the outside world, the world at large, what we think about, how we exist in the world, how much time, energy, and focus do we give to the Caesar in our life? How much do we use with our mental capacity, our thinker, okay? I don't believe that God is housed in our thinker. Okay, so it's amazing that it was a head on the coin. So we, but we do need our mind to get around in the world, don't we? Okay, also the Caesar represents the material world, things that are already made manifest out there. Everything physical, everything, of course, worldly. And just like the Roman armies occupy that land, where am I terrorizing myself? Where are my thoughts occupied? Am I occupied in, in things that frighten me about the outer world, or is my mind occupied on God and the solution? It goes back one side of the coin is heads. Are we going to be outer directed or inner directed? The side of the coin that is related to heads has to do with all of our thinking capacity, our mental faculties, and our physical being. But there's another side of the coin, isn't there? Right? And what do we call that side of the coin? Tails. What kind of tails? What kind of bird is usually on the back of that coin? An eagle. Oh, look, now I can't pick it up. I have a coin right here. And here's a nice eagle on it. It's one ounce of gold, and an eagle is on it. They call these coins eagles. Why? Because gold, one ounce, has Lady Liberty on the front. What does this represent to me, the eagle? Give unto Caesar what is Caesar. One side of the coin is the head, the tail. Eagles. Let's look what eagle means spiritually. The eagle is the chief over all the winged creatures. The eagle conveys the power and messages of the spirit. It is man's connection to the divine because it flies higher than any other bird. Give unto God what is God's. So if the head represents the world of material man and the coinage we need to survive there and pay our way and pay our taxes and so on, then tails must mean that part of ourselves we are asked to give unto God 
our dedication and focus on our spiritual currency. So when Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world, and that we are to give unto God what is God, does that mean we just run around and pray and meditate and do all these things for some heaven that's going to be somewhere out there when we die? No, no. We build up this spiritual currency within us so that we can flow it out into the world and make manifest those things of our dreams because we know in unity that that is how it works. But there's a problem, isn't there? We get so suffocated, or at least I do, in trying to survive out there in the world that sometimes I become like the little kiwi. Not the fruit, but there is a bird. There's a little bird that doesn't fly. Have anyone heard of this? Mm -hmm. The kiwi. And so I, when I get uh, suffocated in fear or what have you, I turn into the little kiwi and I'm on the ground and I can't even get myself to pray sometimes. Anybody ever have that experience? You're so filled with fear you can't pray. Oh, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Thank you all for, for being honest. And so what happens though, the, the biggest prayer I might get out of my mouth is help me, you know. <laughs> but I had a kiwi experience this week. And I knew, I knew I needed prayer. I picked up my books of prayer, but all I could do is, is read them, but I was still thinking about my problem. But we have a solution here, don't we? It's called Silent Unity. I picked up the phone. I called Silent Unity, and what happens on the other end? Hello, what would you like to pray about today? Isn't that wonderful? 1-800-PRAY. <laughs> pray now, I think, is the code word. But they're right there, and... So when we aren't able to fly, we can have these spiritual eagles come down and grab us from the ground and take us up and remind us of what our heritage is and put, it back, put us back in that nest. To remind us that God is ever-present in our lives. To remind us that we can fly above whatever the problem is. To remind us that the problem isn't real, that the only thing that is really real is the presence and power of God that is inside of us, that courses out of us, and that permeates all things in life, and that always, always provides, always survives, always strengthens, always nourishes, always protects, always graces us, is always there. And so then I go and I turn back the news and see what's going on and have to do the whole cycle back over again. <laughs> but, you know, when I'm in fear like that and I know to turn to God, Somehow, some way, call a cha prayer chaplain, you know, do something, call a friend who will pray with me, all these things we do. But when I get in fear, a lot of people think that fear stands for false expectations appearing real. No. I think for me, fear is forgetting everything's all right. <laughs> forgetting everything's all right. That's what God gives us. So we know also that we must turn to this kingdom that's not of this world, but that those of us who have been on the spiritual path for a while, we know it's very real, even though you can't see it or touch it or smell it with the senses, but we can feel it with our uh, internal uh, heart space. We can sometimes feel the energy in our bodies. And any of us that have been on this path absolutely know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have experienced miracles, right? Anybody, anybody experience a miracle in here in their life? Look around. Hold those hands up. Everybody look around. Do you think they're... Right. Right. And so we were brought here as humans, but that's only half of who we are. We're these vast, incredible spiritual beings. Vast, incredible spiritual beings. And how much of our energy, time, and attention do we give to fostering that space inside? Because we were taught and told that if we foster that energy inside and build up that spiritual presence, that, as Christ said, you can say to that mountain, move from here to there, and it will. But as I say, we can take that spiritual essence that we are and that we have built up and hold in our thoughts and in our emotional body a picture of something we'd like to have come to pass, hold it with every belief as if it's already happened, and there it is. This was taught to us. It was taught to us. There's, there are many demonstrations of Christ. What he was most known for were his miracles. 
And oddly enough, when he was first working with Peter, his first disciple, once again, those Pharisees came to him, and they wanted some tax. But this time they wanted temple tax, because you had to pay tax to go into the temple to pray and do your religious practices. And they didn't have the tax. And they were trying to trap him once again. And they said, well, the priests are exempt from temple tax, or if you are a priest, are you saying you're exempt from temple tax? And he goes, no, no, we'll pay the taxes. And Peter's looking at him like, what are you talking about? We're penniless. We have nothing. He said, don't worry. Peter, and we know in unity that Peter represents what? Faith. Faith. Peter, go to the shore. Cast your sea into the water. You will pull out of the very first fish you pull out. We'll have coins in its mouth, and it will be enough to pay the tax. And certainly this happened. It was one of the first miracles. Again, around taxes. <laughs> it's funny. They're with us to stay, I think. But what happened there is, did Peter doubt? No. He did. He followed instructions. He put his feet under his prayers. His faith is when he cast the line. His miracle is when he pulled it in. We have the miracle producing power if we use faith and the belief that yes, it will actually come to pass. Now, I've known this story for a long time about coins coming out of fish's mouths, and I believe even now that I think about it, some of the um, oriental uh, fountains and things I see, they have little fish spouting water with coins in their mouths. So I've thought about this my whole life, and quite often we'll toss coins in where the fish are, right? Like a little good luck wish. I was at Knott's Berry Farm about... 10, 15 years ago, and I was standing waiting for some friends, and there was like a fish pond there with everybody, with fish swimming around in some water. And I looked down, I'm like, what is that? There was this big fish, and it had a silver coin <laughs> embedded in the top of its head. And I thought, wow, it's real, it can happen, you know? I don't know how it happened, but you know. So that sometimes we get little God winks. And I think, too, with coins, Anybody get the, the little coins along the way sometimes that pop out of nowhere, pennies from heaven they sometimes call, to let us know that God is there and God is at work. And so when we complete our taxes this week, if you haven't already done so, please do. They, they really want you to do that. Just remember that we have spiritual currency, and that spiritual currency is eternal gold. And that spiritual currency opens the doors to the kingdoms of heaven. And heaven isn't somewhere out there. Heaven is right here in our own hearts. And we can experience the love, peace, beauty, miracles, happiness, health, wealth, everything. Everything. That... God has promised to us. And so, there are really two choices in the end. We have the outer world. We can focus on fear in all of its many forms, in all of its many presentations. The fear that we concoct in our heads. So heads, one side of the coin. Or the other side. Tails. Fly like an eagle. Fly like an eagle. Fly into the heart of love. For God is love and love is God. And therefore, all we need ever do is just be love. God bless you.